Good morning, everybody. My name is Roland Bone, and as you can see, I work for Barclays Bank. I specialize in economic sanctions, and today I'd like to talk to you about three things. I'd like to talk to you about the sanctions environment in which I work. I'd like to talk to you about the challenges of why it is hard to remit humanitarian aid into conflict and disaster zones, which are subject to sanctions. And I'd also like to talk to you about new technology possibilities, about how we might make that work more efficiently in the future. Economic sanctions are essentially a country-level tool used by country or countries to change and influence behaviour of another country, often with the unintended consequence that the very people who are in need of humanitarian aid in a sanctioned country do not benefit under that regime. This also creates a cost burden for the banks to operate under. The cost of compliance is borne by the banks primarily because of the regulatory regime the banks operate under. Most of the large banks across the UK in the last 10 years have been sub subject to public censure for economic sanctions non-compliance. This has resulted in multi-million pound fines and remediation programmes by the banks. What this in effect means is the industry as a whole, because of this collective action against the banks, has had to change its risk appetite and approach. And in certain sectors of that industry, that means de-risking the client base. And what that in effect means is the banks no longer provide the services to higher risk client groups. And what is a higher risk client group? Typically, it's those receiving humanitarian aid or those who are affected by sanctioned countries. Myself, I'm not an, um, a technologist. I'm a financial crime expert working at Barclays. The lens I bring to this is that I have the operational experience of how sanctions are actually implemented within the financial services sector. We're starting to see a lot of change about enabling business rather than simply saying no to business. So rather than de-risking, it's about enablement. Today you'll hear a lot about technology and the disruption factors within that. What I would say is that think beyond the disruption. Think big picture and think end to end. Technology is only part of the solution. So as fast as the technology is built, you need the subject matter experts who are not technologists to help shape and think. I'd like to talk a bit about blockchain technology. So blockchain technology has its origins in Bitcoin. Following the financial crash in 2008, a collective or an individual, we don't really know the true origins of them, called Satoshi Nakamoto, developed a remittance platform where a remitter and a beneficiary could send a token of value as a virtual currency between two people that was unfettered by government. That is an absolute first, an unfettered currency that could be transferred electronically. Not only that, the technology that supports it is on a distributed ledger and it's validated by common agreement. So what do we mean by that? What's the simplest way to think about that? The simplest way to think about that is if everyone in the audience had a copy of Encyclopedia Britannica, a paper copy, and if that paper copy needed a little addendum update and you sent that paper addendum update out, some people might not get it, some people might put it in the wrong section, some people might interpret it differently, some people might lose it. What if that update, and Encyclopedia Britannica was Wikipedia, it updated instantaneously, it was validated by common agreement, and everyone had the same record. That's quite powerful. Not only that, the transactions themselves are secure and auditable. The transactions are secured by cryptography. Whenever the transaction happens, and it forms a packet of data, and it goes onto a blockchain, that's effectively an immutable record. And that's, again, powerful. If you think about it from a charity dispersing humanitarian aid, how do you track the aid that is going to the beneficiaries? How do you make sure the correct beneficiary is receiving the aid? How do, how do you know that there's been no filtering or tampering with the aid en route? How might disruptive technology such as a blockchain be relevant today? So if we think about uses about how it could be applied, you can apply it to identity management. Imagine if you didn't have to go down to the bank and identify yourself with a passport and a utility bill each time. Imagine if you could have your identity pointed back at you from government agencies. What about global payments? If you want to send a payment to the other side of the world, typically it costs you a lot of money to send that. There's a foreign exchange risk in there, there's a currency route. 
What if you could strip the process down and make it lean and simplified on the blockchain? What about voting? Very topical in, in the UK. What if you could vote through a blockchain? You might not have to have a double count of, of a vote. You might be able to ensure that everyone is entitled to vote, vote and it's auditable. Everyone can see the exchange of what, what went on and what was voted. What about intellectual property? Many music artists are starting to register their intellectual property rights on the blockchain. If we look at what's going on in financial crime of examples of where a blockchain has been used, there's a company called Everledger which is looking at a conflict diamond blockchain. How do you track and monitor diamonds? If you laser etch them and register them on a blockchain that's immutable, you have a good solid record. All this starts to begin to merge together with other technologies as we've heard already this morning. Don't think about blockchain in isolation. Think about how a blockchain as a clever record might work with machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'd like to talk a little bit about the payments flow process for banking and humanitarian aid. At present, if you have a charity that's receiving donations, the donations can come in in physical cash, they can be deposited in electronic payments. Those then flow, th flow through um, the payments process. <coughs> The process in, in the centre where we have the friction, that is where we see aid being slowed down. And the reason for that is it's a cost of compliance. The friction is caused by regulatory requirements. So if we think about the sanctions laws that are out there, the laws that, that, that are out there that require us to comply with the sanctions requirements place a burden on the banks to understand the transaction. They un and once we understand the transaction, the transaction can either proceed or it needs a licensing requirement or it's rejected. And that licensing process isn't simple. There are either carve-outs within the regulations that allow you to process a transaction straight through, or you can apply to a competent authority who administers the sanctions regime for a specific license. All of that takes time and slows down aid to those who might need it most quickly. If we think about the process and the facilitation risk that banks run, the reason the banks have been fined in the past is predominantly down to facilitation risk. How do we know that the aid payments that we are processing do not end up in a terrorist finance, financier's hands? How do we know that aid remitted through the platform goes to the right people? And that is very hard. And that is where the banking industry and the third sector can come together to understand the due diligence model that needs to happen. If we think about the onward transmission of, of, of the funds, so once it flows from the charity through the intermediaries, how do we know that the correspondent institutions in there are also valid? If you have a distribution model in a charitable um, org organisation that then flows the, the money out into the, the disaster zone, how do you know that there's not interference in the, in the funds there? In terms of Syria, I'd like to talk a little bit about Syria and what's going on there at the moment and why it's close to my heart, because I've been working on this recently. So in Syria, we've got multiple parties at civil war and a refugee crisis. So we have a mobile, fluid situation of what territories are controlled by different parties. We've also got displaced persons being mobile in that region. There's no unified global agreement on Syria. And effectively, that's because we have a voting system at, at the UN and Russia is exercising its veto. Therefore, there is no unified agreement from the UN Security Council to implement sanctions. What does happen is that the US enforces their own sanctions regime. The EU has a sanctions regime. And by way of derogation down to the UK, the UK adopts the EU sanctions legislation for Syria. The UK can make it super equivalent if it wants to, but essentially it adopts the EU framework. What that means is that potentially for a bank with a US clearing correspondent in it, you have to apply not only the EU sanctions, but the US sanctions. And that becomes difficult because both are written on different basis and there's not a direct read across between the US and the EU sanctions. Neighbouring country political alignments. <clears throat> Again, as we've seen recently, trying to correspond with a bank that borders onto Syria is difficult. If we think about the infrastructure and the financial institutions in there, the financial institutions are often subject to sanctions. The infrastructure, even if you manage to get money 
into Syria electronically? How would you distribute it? How would you get money in there physically? Would you overland it into the country? It's very difficult. You have a physical security risk if you take money in there physically. Basically, it boils back round to the due diligence question. It's hard to identify who is who. I'd like to talk to you very quickly about an experiment. And this is uh, a model that we're trying to develop um, in partnership with a couple of other banks. And essentially, this looks at providing a blockchain platform payment rail to transfer value to beneficiaries quickly. And the way you see it working is we have charities on a liquidity pool at, w at the left-hand side, a platform that is created on a blockchain which allows you to remit a value to the beneficiaries. And that remittance can be by quick reference code. So if in infrastructure allows it, you can basically use it as a quick reference code onto a mobile device, or you can use a paper quick reference code. That is then spent by the beneficiaries with the merchants. The merchants are pre-selected for being sustainable, so they have a presence there. The merchants then ex scan the quick reference code, and that's what entitles the beneficiary to the aid, be that food, medicine, shelter, education, materials, security. It doesn't matter what it is. You can audit the trail of what it has been spent on. The merchants then clear this back with an aggregator, and the aggregator also requires a liquidity pool at the other end in the form of a government. Now, the technology build for this, in terms of the platform, we estimate about 80 days. The technology is actually really quite fast to build. The politics of making that work to find merchants who are willing to operate in the country, who are stable, an aggregator to receive all of these quick reference codes, and then a government to provide a liquidity pool at the other end is much more political. And that's where the time ta is taken. But from a sanctions point of view, we, we can build that. We can get it licensed. Lastly, I'd like you to think about disruptive technology that's still developing and ex experimental. All this merges together. Within the bank, we run a number of work streams that looks at blockchain. It's become really apparent in the last six months that artificial intelligence and machine learning that have run as separate silos, all three of them start to merge now. Technology moves faster than the regulation allows. There is a catch-up game with our regulators, both in the UK and the US, about how they keep ahead of what is happening. The UK have a sandbox environment for the Financial Conduct Authority that allows us to develop a payment rail like what we just saw there and experiment with it in a regulated, safe environment. So you can make it and develop it and then make it scalable. I'd like to leave you with a thought that the big picture is the end-to-end -end deployment. So as we saw in the model and we started off with, the technology is just one part of it. And again, it's not just the technology build, it's the broader build about the geopolitical factors that come into play if you try and make a scalable solution. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm on the Conversation Starter app. Uh, you have my uh, email address there. If you'd like to chat over coffee throughout the breaks or at lunch, please come see me. Thank you for listening. <laughs>